15, 2010. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm here today with Phil Enslow and Tony Hilliard, who are also volunteers. And we're honored to have with us today Mr. James Tysinger, who is a World War II veteran and has kindly agreed to come talk to us about his experiences, both his life experiences and his World War II experiences. Uh, this is part of the Veterans History Project and we're extremely grateful for Mr. Tysinger coming in. Uh, Mr. Tysinger, would, give a, would you give us your full name and date of birth? <clears throat> My name is James Wesley Tysinger. I was born in August 9, 1921. And what is your current address? My current address is 3781 Watkins Place, Northeast, Atlanta, 30319. Okay. Uh, once again, we want to thank you for coming in today. And uh, would you tell us <coughs> a little bit about your upbringing? Okay. Well, as I said, I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina. And of course, it was a as I grew up, I was, it was a Depression era. And uh, <coughs> my father was out of a job. He, uh, when I was uh, about high school time, he um, found a job in Washington, D.C. I got a cough, I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. <coughs> Washington, D.C. And we moved there, and I went to high school in Washington, D.C. and graduated in 39. I did not have the money to go to college. Uh, I did try at George Washington at night, but it just didn't fit in with it. The work schedule because I was working in a grocery store and they wouldn't make much and they couldn't couldn't make the uh, lot of the classes. <coughs> I've always been interested in the military. I one time I wanted to go to West Point, and uh, in those days it was difficult to get a political appointment because it's much more limited than it is today. I joined the guard in July of '40. Uh, in August of 40, they read mobilization orders out. Uh, we, the guard, our, our unit was very much underpowered. And it's difficult for people today to realize our military stance at that time. Um, we had World War I helmets. We had the, the World War I rifles of Springfield, which is a good rifle. We didn't have any machine guns. Uh, we did have up-to-date fire control equipment, and that's what I was in, was fire control section. And we had three-inch anti-aircraft guns, which were outdated at that time because most of the equipment was being sent to England at the time. Uh, we were mobilized on 6 January 1941, and we went by military convoy uh, and it was part of it, it was uh, bringing Americans aware that we were in a mobilization situation and periodically we would <coughs> set up guns, our guns and, flat, and searchlights uh, to attract people. I remember in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, some people came in and know what was going on with all the searchlights flying around. We went to Fort Bliss, Texas. There were five regiments of, thank you, there were five regiments of anti-aircraft artillery there. Uh, this was really the anti-aircraft center. Uh, one of the units was a 200th regiment from New Mexico, and they were ordered out in August of, of uh, 41 <coughs> and went to the Philippines, and they were the ones that had participated in the, in, in the Baton Death March. 200. The, uh, the, uh, we went to uh, uh, Fort Bliss, we were trained there for a year, uh, and um, then Pearl Harbor happened. Let me say one thing about it. I don't know who did the staff work or how it was accomplished, <clears throat> but we started packing Sunday night. The flat cars were in there the next day to load our guns on. And, and where, where were you then? At Fort Bliss. Fort Bliss. Okay. They load our guns on and Pullman cars came in 
we, we loaded all of our equipment in and we pulled out on Wednesday. Uh, as you went west, uh, we didn't really know where we were going. We were just going west. And you could see the roads, convoys, all of them headed west. My unit went to Washington State. Uh, we had the anti-aircraft protection of the Wilmington Navy Yard, which was the number one Navy Yard on the West Coast. The only one was sufficient size to hold a battleship. Uh, we were we were filling sandbags on Christmas Day. Uh, we were set up in a schoolyard and actually used a school to to. Uh, bunk in until we got our tents up and other equipment. We, um, I, I want to again mention the fact that how unequipped we were. I mentioned the fact we didn't have machine guns. We used two by fours to simulate machine guns. Uh, infantry regiments at that time were using stovepipes to simulate wars. And there's a picture that I recall seeing in one of the magazines in the, in the Carolina maneuvers where they had trucks with tank written on the side of them because we didn't have tanks. And at Fort Bliss at that time was the first cavalry division and they were all horses. Uh, if you've never seen a, a cavalry division of all the horses and all the stuff they generate, <laughs> you come to Fort Bliss in the time you can see it. Uh, the first cow division now, of course, is, it was changed and it's in, more of an infantry division than anything else. But we in, in, uh, in Washington State, uh, the requirement to go to OCS was it would be 21. When the war started, they lowered to 20. And so I applied for OCS and was accepted and went to OCS in April of 42. Uh, at Camp Davis, North Carolina. Again, this was an anti aircraft center that was there. And uh, I graduated, or was commissioned, 10 July of that year with orders to go to for the San, San Francisco and be assigned there. And I was assigned to a Georgia National Guard unit from Calhoun, Georgia. Uh, that was my first introduction to really to Georgia. Uh, and, um, we stayed there. We were we were had our guns, of course, in placement for protection. But we got orders in August. I got there the first of August. At the, in the middle of August, we had orders. We were going overseas. Okay. Now, before we get into going overseas, I want to back up and ask you just a few questions sure. about what you told us. Would you describe in, in a little bit of detail exact when you said fire control? Would yes. you describe for the for well, the record what that is? At, and that, at that particular time. We had two instruments. One of them was the, the director, which was a M4 director made by Sperry Gyrosco Company. And that was a director with uh, cams in there which duplicated uh, the uh, firing tables. Okay. Uh, the second instrument we had was, uh, was the uh, height finder. Uh, those two items were up to date. And the height finder, of course, picks up the, the uh, altitude of the objective, and we track it with the uh, M4, and through cables, it's connected to the guns, and there's a reader on the guns, they match the reader, so the guns are pointed in the right direction with the right fuse on it. Again, how antiquated we were, when we were at Fort Bliss, we were firing with a uh, powder train fuse. Now, a powder train fuse is a fuse that has a, a spiral powder around it, and how you turn it is how much power you expose to it. <clears throat> well, those were calibrated at uh, in, on the down the coast of, uh, of um, an ordnance proving ground. Aberdeen over through you know. And the, the first round we fired, it went way over. So we had to recalculate all the tables. Later on, 
uh, they got they developed the mechanical fuse, and then later on in the war we developed the, the proximity fuse. But these were the early ones. Uh, but my task was the chief of I was in. I'd had some junior ROTC, and we had very few people, so I made corporal the first week and started two weeks later, type thing. Uh, but I was chief of the fire control section. Uh, but we went to uh, OCS, it was, it was set at Camp Davis, North Carolina, uh, and you had your, you can make certain requests, I think it was one, basically one of the East Coast, one of the West Coast. And I chose the West Coast, that's why I ended up with the 214th, uh, H battery 214th of the Coast Artillery from Calhoun, Georgia. We uh, got orders in August that we were going to be shipped overseas and so we started packing and um, we sailed in September, I don't remember the exact date, <coughs> aboard the, SS, the USS Mount Vernon. Now this was uh, ship was the former SS Washington that took uh, the president in World War I to Paris for the peace conference. And I know all of But we went across un unescorted and to, and we didn't know where we were going. It was a code name where we were headed for. And we ended up in Auckland, New Zealand. And we stayed, uh, we landed there and they put us in a former New Zealand camp. We were there for, until our equipment came by freighter, which was a month later. It, it took us, it takes you about a, a month, about a week to go across on a fast transport from San Francisco to, to Auckland, New Zealand. It takes a, tra uh, a, uh, a uh, cargo ship about a month. So when our equipment came in, we again loaded it up at that time, loaded what you call <clears throat> combat loaded, instead of just putting it in, in you, you put it in in a way you take it out if you're going in combat. And we sailed from New Zealand and went to New Caledonia. Uh, that was, uh, that was approximately October of that year. and we, New Zealand, I mean, uh, New Caledonia was a French possession. It was the possession that we were the fallback position in case we lost Guadalcanal. Uh, and we had uh, Air Force there. We had uh, three, uh, three regiments of former National Guard unit. Prior to, world, to the start of World War II, the Army Division had was uh, what they call a square division with four regiments in it. Under when World War II started, even before they started, they went to the Triangle Division with three regiments, which means there was a surplus regiment. And these three surplus regiments were sent to New Caledonia, and they formed the Americal Division, which is the only unnumbered division in the United States Army. And General Collins headed it up. He later became uh, Army General in France. Uh, we stayed there. We received orders to go to Guadalcanal in December. Uh, and one of the reasons you couldn't get in into, into Guadalcanal is we didn't have sea power. Now, what was the situation on Guadalcanal at the time? Well, the, it, it, the critical situation on Guadalcanal was, and if I recall from reading history, it was October of uh, 42. Uh, we did send one regiment, 164th Infantry, uh, from the Samaritan Division, did go in. And um, the uh, Regimental commander, knowing his men had never been in combat and were going in the first time, he and uh, 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 Colonel Puller at that time got together and mingled the two units together, and and that was one of the major attacks that they, they participated in. So October was a big time, and he, according to 
history that I've read, Hap Arnold had visited Guadalcanal and had reported back he couldn't hold it. Uh, the, uh, the, the American general in charge of the, all the army in that area, he uh, disagreed with that report. And that's when we sent the, the, the uh, 164th entry and and you were there two months after that, right? You were and there we went in. We went in. Actually, got in there a little after Christmas, and I was, I was there the last few days. Uh, we started pushing them back. When I got in there, I, I think the line was 20 miles out from Henderson Field. Tell us about what you saw and experienced on Guadalcanal. Well, you know. You, you, you don't know what you're experiencing. Uh, you're apprehensive. And uh, as we went in that morning, as we, uh, they, let me go back one time. The day before we went, uh, we got to Guadalcanal, we saw the American fleet. I don't know if you've ever seen a naval fleet put their ships from horizon to horizon. And they crossed us. Uh, and um, in Morrison's book, history book on the, on the Navy, he mentions our unit going in, or what they call the Unholy Four. These were president lines from, designed to go from New Orleans to South America. So Jackson, uh, Adams, Crescent City, and I don't remember what the other one was. I was on the Crescent City. And when we went in, we had to unload ship. We started at dawn, and at four o'clock, whatever position is, that ship's gone. So we had that length of time to unload the ships. So we unloaded the ships and piled the stuff on the bank, and uh, being a lieutenant at the time, I was left behind to clean up a lot of ice, and the rest of them went in. So I remember getting on the truck, riding through, and I said, this is Guadalcanal going through the, down through a, a jungly road. Uh, and then we got to where we were going to be. We had the Fighter Strip 1, which was a Marine Fighter Strip on the canal. Uh, it, at that time it was a dirt strip, and later they put coral and metal down to make a, a runway on. Uh, and we occupied that. They started sending people back to the States uh, to form other units, and I was forced to, I was picked to be the battery commander. I was. Uh, I think 22 years old uh, when I received, got that appointment. Uh, we received many, many bombing. I did not get under any small arms fire, uh, but I got hell scared out of me frequently by bombs. Japanese planes bombing Japanese out. Bomb and usually they would come in in the night uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 or 2 o'clock. We had coast watchers, which were uh, former plantation people in the islands. They had been mobilized by the Australians uh, as coast watchers and given radios, and they would radio back when they saw the Japanese coming in. We could pick them up on radar 100 miles out. When you picked them up on radar 100 miles out, you, we went to what we call condition yellow. That meant that we manned our guns and everybody was ready if, if, if it came in. When the condition red was when the searchlights picked them up and they were coming in on the bombing run. Uh, I'll re relate one incident. I had a, my uh, truck drivers and mechanics had a habit since they didn't have a a combat assignment on a gun, they'd stay in their bunk until uh, Condition red, and they go running, dashing out, and jump in a foxhole. Well, that, that happened one morning about two o'clock, and this uh, sergeant or a corporal, I think he was, then jumped in his foxhole, and nothing but noise to him, a wild pig had fallen in the hole. So he hit that pig, and that pig squealed, and he screamed, and I thought sure that we had some Japanese coming on top of us, but we went down there and. <laughs> They, they kept the pig for a while and barbecued it at that time. So 
they were, those are humorous things that happened to make yeah. it building. But uh, we were bombed many times, and the, the largest raid I saw was maybe a hundred Jap planes coming in. And we we were for, at that time the Japanese uh, naval pilots had been the best ones had been killed, and so but we our, our fighters got them and, and pretty well wiped them all out. I was on Guadalcanal the, the day that Yamamoto shot, got shot down, and we knew it instantly over the island uh, that they'd gotten him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was secret that it went around the island, but Yamamoto was shot down. Uh, and, Would you uh, explain who that is? Just well, the... Yamamoto was the admiral in charge of the Japanese Navy. He was the one who planned Pearl Harbor an outstanding individual and had been to, spent a lot of time in the United States and basically had warned the Japanese, uh, you get into this, I'll last a year, and then on, we, we, we're basically done for. But, but he was a brilliant individual. We, the Navy had broken, as you know, <coughs> we broke the Japanese code. I read this subsequently, and they picked the data up in Pearl Harbor, and um, Nimitz sent word down, get him. Uh, when we first went out there, I mentioned uh, Hap Arnold came out there. Hap Arnold didn't send any airplane, Army airplanes. They, did old, they sent the old P-40 and P-39, which uh, was, I think, even the Russians would have had them, but that's, that was the Army's condition, and they were, could not fly high and they were used mostly for ground support. And then later we got the P-38s, and that was the one that uh, Yamamoto, that shot Yamamoto down. Okay. And one of the things people don't understand or realize that Lindbergh, who was ostracized because of his pre-war speeches, American first, Roosevelt, he was a full colonel, in the Air Force Reserve, and President Roosevelt would not let him be called active duty. So he went to work for Lockheed and came to Guadalcanal. And he was the one that taught the people in the P-38 uh, how to put the belly tanks on and how to fly them in there. The rumor is that he even flew one mission, shot a Jap down. I don't know whether that's true or not, but he, he was a uh, he was one that pushed the P-38 uh, in that. We were there, uh, well, we were there a little over a year because, and things had quite quiet down. We still got some bombing, but it, by that time, it um, it tapered off. And you were in charge of the battery? Yeah. I had a battery. And what was your unit at the time? The H battery, uh, uh, the 214th. Um, Part of my, when I had one gun position at the edge of a uh, uh, ammunition dump, and the ammunition dump caught on fire. And um, we had to pull the whole battery out, if you see pieces of uh, 155 and 105 and shells flying through the air like rain, and so we got out of the place. But uh, it was a, such a disaster thing that they were, uh, as I understand it, we were concerned about what the effect would be on the future. Uh, we went from <coughs> from Guadalcanal, they sent us to New Zealand for rest leave, R&R, &R, and we stayed down there. Were you on the North Island or the South Island there? We were, we were uh, on the North Island uh, across, there's a little street, street across, um, a little town across from Auckland called Hamilton. And about 15 miles north of Hamilton was a New Zealand Army base, and that's where we were. Okay. Uh, I remember when we landed there, we marched uh, from, we had to march quite a distance because we didn't have trucks. And we came across a, one of the farmers there, the milk cans out there. And I went up and paid for it, and we got a gallon of milk can. That was the first milk we had had. <laughs> Uh, we, we, later on, we got all the milk we wanted to after that time. We were there for 
I don't know, maybe three months. I was there. I know when when uh, D Day happened. I was there then. I was in New I was in New Zealand. What was the reaction of the troops when you heard about D Day occurring? Well, the, the news that we got was that we had landed, but there was no details about the fact that uh, how close it came, or the, what was the casualties involved and thing. Uh, and but that uh, <coughs> uh, that came up to information. We were then ordered. Uh, incidentally, we had been equipped with what we call, I was an automatic weapons battalion, a battery. We had 37 millimeters, which is a, is a good anti-tank gun and it does have a limited range. But the, the up-to-date model was a 40 millimeter Bulford gun, which England had and we were going, we, uh, we were going to pick them up. So we went to New, we were sailed from Falkland on the French ship the Rochambeau and went into um, uh, uh, to, uh, New Guinea uh, at uh, uh, Pinshaven and um, we were issued new equipment, new 40 millimeters and other new equipment and trained on those. Uh, we were there several months and they, uh, then we were ordered, we, we sailed from there and went to um, uh, up the island and you get to uh, and prepared to, it was, they were assembling a convoy there. Is this New Guinea or is this late New Guinea? New Guinea. This is still New Guinea, okay. Yeah, we were in New Guinea and uh, we went into the, uh, and formed a convoy and we went, um, we had Thanksgiving dinner there on board the ship. A, the reason I remember it, the army insisted that everybody have turkey on Thanksgiving. Well, turkey is thawed kind of bit fast. And we had food poisoning. And I put 15 men in the hospital and we sailed the next day uh, for. Uh, Lake. We landed, um, the combat had moved inland where we landed. We landed there and we were there for about a month. Uh, we got our equipment together, combat loaded again, and I was ordered, my battery was ordered to uh, protect the landing site when we landed in the Philippines. Uh, now what's involved in setting up well, you yeah. have to have you have to you have to have your equipment. The first thing you need is get the gun up and ammunition and everything else to get ready to combat. And what I had done, I put I, I fixed my trucks up so because we had a limited number of trucks, but I fixed my trucks up so they're all uniform. Uh, and the men knew where their equipment was and how to get to it. Um, so I went up, uh, uh, I went in with the 14th Corps, I think, I don't remember it was the 37th, 38th Division, it was a, it was a cyclone division north from uh, Indiana. We made the landing uh, on the, below the Lingan Gulf with the objective of cutting across to uh, Olongapo, which was, had been a Navy base and then going across the top of the baton, cutting the Japs off so they couldn't come in. And then we, the unit went down uh, baton to Marvelous and then to Corregidor. Now I didn't get that far. I, I was, my unit once, uh, uh, we, we had moved inland. I, I had the anti-aircraft defense of, of the uh, Aircraft of the airport, and, and this is Leyte. No, this or, was in Luzon. This is Luzon. Okay. Luzon. And uh, what was the situation on Luzon at the time? Had we occupied the entire island? Reading back, there is a, a string of mountains, uh, symbolic, I think it is, mountains, and then there's a valley, 
and the Sixth Army was driving down that valley, to, which was straight, and that's where the Japs came in, for, headed for Manila. We were on this side of it, and we were going across top of Baton to keep the Japs coming in that way. Uh, but the Sixth Army had the bulk of the fight. Uh, they had, uh, and going down the valley uh, into, uh, into uh, Manila. I, uh, as curiosity, I did go across. Uh, there's a, as you come out of a longer pole, on the top of Baton, there is a trail going up they call Zigzag Hill. And when the, uh, our troops tried to get up that thing, and we lost a lot of people because it's just like this going up. And uh, <clears throat> what we were doing is, from the airstrip where I was, they were flying planes up and dropping napalm on top of them up there. Uh, and uh, we, uh, it, it was, you could see it. It was, it was in, in within range. You could hear the guns going off and hear all that. It was close enough there. But uh, we did not have any air raids there because they had already been down. Uh, the Japanese had been pretty well destroyed. I, uh, then when war was over, we were, had been moved from that place to Clark Field. And uh, we were in Clark Field when, uh, when, when, uh, when war was over. We had heard that we had dropped a firebomb. That was the word we had. And uh, they, they kept us posted about the Japanese plane flying in. We had to be a white plane and follow a certain course coming in. So we followed that. By that time, we had. Now, a, that's, give a little more detail about that white plane. What, what exactly? The Japanese was had, were coming in to meet MacArthur to arrange surrender terms, okay. and uh, it went into Nichols Field, which is close to close to Manila. Uh, we were kept posted that that was taking place uh, from the airstrip that I was on. The was part of the 11th Airborne unit, so the ones that went in to, to, to uh, Tokyo. Uh, MacArthur had a psychologically, uh, he made all of the men had to be at least six foot tall, so the Japs had to look up at them. And they all had new equipment, because the Japs equipment was, was pretty run down. Uh, and uh, it's uh, we knew the war was over, and we had uh, turned in our equipment, and uh, then they moved us into a replacement depot. And I saw some of the British, Australian soldiers that had been captured. They were still there. And they were walking skeletons. They had gotten them out. The Americans were taken out immediately by ship, plane. Got they got they took, took them out. Uh, but these uh, these were the Australian troops. And they, I, uh, if you ever seen a walking skeleton, that's 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 what they looked like at the time. We were in the there, and we had to stay in that re replacement depot. So some of my lieutenants. And I've been over there, and everyone had to stay behind and do some, some other type of assignment. And I, uh, they, my men went home a month before I did. Uh, I don't know why. And then I, and I was ordered home uh, in October of uh, it was 45, 40, 46, 45. I lose track of the years and that thing. And uh, I came back um, on, the, on the ship coming back. This was we hit, we hit the edge of that typhoon where they uh, we wiped, where several of our ships were sunk by the typhoon. And we had one incident. I knew, if, you, if you've ever been in your bunk and you can see the waves about 50 feet over the top of your head, I, mean, I just got my bunk and 
jam our feet against it and roll the wood. But uh, we burned out the bearings on the ship. So we were tossing around like a cork. No movement. And they were sending tugs out to pick us up, but the guys worked overnight and got it going again. We came into San Francisco and uh, moved up to uh, Stoneman and uh, stayed there about two days and then uh, took train back to Fort Meade, Maryland. That's where I was discharged at Fort Meade. Describe your feeling when you saw the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Well, you know, we, the first thing, that we heard the radio and we heard these commercials and these dang gone songs and we said, what in the hell are these crazy people doing there? I mean, it, we hadn't heard anything like that. Uh, we were fortunate, uh, but they, they did have finally, not initially, they had finally, they had uh, uh, Armed Forces Radio that we could pick it up. On Guadalcanal, we picked up Tokyo Rose. Really? And uh, it, it was very good. She went on this by regimental number to, to right. us there. And uh, she had the best <coughs> collection of records you ever heard. So we listened to Tokyo Road. And at the time, we got shortwave, and you know how it comes in and out? It's when Georgia played the Rose Bowl. Oh, in 1942, right? Yeah, we heard that. We, we, we picked up part of that. Huh. But Tokyo, I had one of them in actually uh, wrote a letter to Tokyo Rose, care of the American Red Cross, please play more at Donna Shore Records. <laughs> I don't know whether, uh, where, how far that went. But, uh, it, 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 it had an effect to this degree. She made the comment over there that Adderburn would make you sterile. And Adburn is a malaria suppressant. And the malaria rate went up like this. So we had to have a four inch every day. And an officer had to stand there and watch the guy take an Adderburn tablet. <laughs> I've looked down more tonsils than that thing doing that. Uh, even so, I had malaria three times. Um, the first time it was very, very bad. I was hospitalized and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to go through if you never had malaria on it. But, uh, and, and most of my men at one time or another came down with a degree of malaria. I had a, the first time I had it, I had it real bad. But, uh, they got most, they got some of the mosquitoes under control. Uh, but that, that was one incident we did have. The, 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 she did have an effect right. on, on the effort. I want to go back and ask you a few things about your sure. earlier experiences. When you first joined the Army, the war had not started. That's right. It was in summer of 40. Well, what did you anticipate? In other words, did you, know, did you was, think the war was coming? Or? I, you know, the draft, you had to be sent out of the draft, but since I was in the Guard, I didn't have to sign up the Guard. I was in. But, uh, you know, it didn't bother me. And, uh, Did you think a war was going to be starting? Well, it, it, uh, it there was all I didn't know, but it it was indication that that uh, we were helping. During, we we were helping England. I was sent while I was at Fort Bliss. I, they sent me to the Sperry Gyroscope Company for. Uh, training on, on the M4 uh, unit uh, of gun control, <coughs> and what they what it involved in was how to maintain them, how to repair them, that sort of thing. And while they're a spare gyroscope, you see them going down the line. They were going to England. Mm -hmm. uh, we were shipping. Let's say I told you beforehand, we didn't have machine guns. We had two by fours and some of the machine guns. Even when we went to Guadalcanal, we didn't have any. Now, I'll say one thing in Guadalcanal when I got there, my unit relieved the 3rd Marine Defense Battalion, a unit of the 3rd Marine Defense Battalion. And they had accumulated a lot of machine guns. I had, I had almost had a machine gun very mainly company 1-1 at the time. We had to turn them in. Uh, 
Uh, Where were you when Pearl Harbor was attacked, and what was your feeling at the time? I'd gone to church that day in El Paso, and a family invited me out to have lunch with them, and I'd accepted. We had lunch and was sitting there, and the radio came on. At Pearl Harbor it happened, all troops report to Fort Bliss immediately. Mm. And so I went back out there and bugles were blowing and uh, I won't say it was chaos, but people just, we knew we were going. So we started packing that night. Mm. Uh, I can't say that I was apprehensive. Uh, it was just something we had to do. Uh, and as I said, the logistics of that, that mobilization is just fantastic. Uh, it, and I, the other thing is, you know, you're young like that, uh, you're independent, away from home. As a sergeant, I was making $60 a month, and that was more money than I ever had in my life. I had more spending money. I was sending some home. and. It was, it was a time. I, don't, I can't say it was apprehensive. Now moving ahead, when you you said you found out the war was over, when you, how did you find out and what were the reaction of the troops? Well, we knew when the Japanese came in to, to, that it was essentially going to be over. When they came in to negotiate with MacArthur, as I understand reading from history, he required the, air, the road from the Tokyo airport into town have troops along that facing outward. So when they came in, he, he was psychological, he played psychology on them. And uh, it was over, uh, we'd come home. Now we had, during, during this period of time, we got a certain allocation of, uh, people who could come home. Um, I don't remember now, we had probably two per unit that would let them leave early and we got replacement. I know I lost my first sergeant and uh, they had, uh, they would come home, so a lot of them got home early uh, than, uh, than the rest of us. <coughs> like, I, I think it was a, uh, war was over, and the main thing was the was camera. We had to turn our equipment in and make certain we had it all there. And I know we ran into some damn character there. I want to know why, where all our telephone wire was, <laughs> why we didn't have as much as we had been given us. They'd been out of the field and tanks had run over it and everything else. And <coughs> we couldn't account for it. Yeah, you you served on some islands that were you know, very prominent in the war, and uh, you know, the, the stories of what went on there are part of history. During your time on these islands, what events impacted you the most? You know, Guadalcanal is, in, in all truth and honesty, it's two degrees in the equator and it's hot, but at nighttime you slip under a blanket. And the men had a had a, wear a field jacket at nighttime. It uh, and in, in nights uh, being close to the equator, when the moon come up, it was light enough you could play football. We just tossed around something like that. So it's a, it was it's a time of boredom, and it's you know and trying to keep people on their toes about keeping their equipment up and everything ready to go. Uh, and so I, uh, I think that's, uh, and I did have a chance uh, on the canal. I went, on, went up to Cape Esperance, where the Japanese had final place up there. And um, there's still some dead Japs still up there at that time. Uh, I picked up a Jap rifle I got at home I'm on, there's a up at uh, Thomas up at uh, uh, 
Alcoa, there's a museum up there, and I'm going to give it to them because sure. the battery that I had is now located in the core. Is that right? Yeah, age battery. It, we, we changed and we reorganized on Guadalcanal and they dropped the, the regimental group and we became 950th Automatic Weapons Battalion. Uh, and that's where we became Alice D. Berry, 950th. When you were serving, did, did you realize you were part of one of the more significant events in world history? No, I don't think so. We just uh, go over there and do what we were supposed to do. Uh, as I said, I always, I always liked the Army. I know there's a lot of people, I guess, that liked the Army. When I got home, I'll be honest with you, um, the, I heard a fire siren, and I was on the siren go off. I was ready to drop down the floor. Yeah. And I got married, and I'd rather sleep on the floor than sleep in the bed because it was too soft. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of those things, adjustments you make. Yeah. The other thing is, I was able to go to to um, Walter Reed and get my teeth fixed yeah. uh, for, because they'd been in pretty bad shape. Uh, we had we had dentists, and I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, but the dentist has a, a dental machine. He is a, it, it's a pulley, and he cranks it with his feet to turn the bit, and uh, that's not very comfortable. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I got I checked, and the we were fortunate. Uh, I got a reserve officer getting ready to go back to practice dentist, and he did a good job. <laughs> didn't just patch it up, he did a good job for me. Have you been able to keep up with any of your fellow troops? We have, uh, we did have, most of them are dead now, uh, badly. We had a, periodically, we'd have a reunion in Calhoun, mm -hmm. and I'd get to see some of them, talk to them, tell lies about each other, <laughs> other things, uh, things that went on. But, it, it, and, uh, as most, all those now are all dead. Um, because I'm getting up there. I'm 99. I'll be 89. I'm 89 this year. I would never know it. You, uh, you look great. You, you kept yourself in shape. Uh, and, uh, Tell us a little bit about what you did after you got out of the service. Well, well, well actually, you, you stayed in the reserve. Apparently. I stayed in the reserve. Uh, I said I liked the military. And I ended up in what here. We were part of a field, I changed field artillery. We were part of a field artillery group under Reserve 12th Corps, that's the old Patton's old corps. And I did go to, uh, we had an uh, opportunity to go to school at night uh, and take uh, courses from Command General Staff College. And then each summer we would go to uh, Fort Jackson and we would have two weeks of lectures for, on, on that. And in the last after four years, the fourth year, we went to Leavenworth and uh, finished up at Leavenworth. So I got my certificate, Command General Staff, as a reserve officer. And what uh, rank did you retire as? I retired as a lieutenant colonel. If I'd stayed on, they were they were going to give. One of my friends stayed on long and got to be a full colonel, <laughs> but I was I was ready to get out. Uh, I was in the I wanted to get in the legislature, so I yeah. got out. And how long did you serve in the Georgia legislature? I served 30 years. Yeah. Congratulations. I served uh, two years with us to Maddox and then four years or eight years with uh, Busby as well. Yeah, I told people, I used to have go down and have coats and uh, eat a sandwich with Jimmy Carter when he was governor because the Senate was divided at the time. Maddox was lieutenant governor. And uh, the Democrats were divided, Maddox people and Carter people. And the five of us Republicans were the swing votes. So we were royally entertained down the stairs. <laughs> I bet uh, you were. Even, even in fact, my wife and I even <laughs> been, had uh, dinner one night with, uh, out of dimension with Jimmy Carter and his wife. Uh, they, so it's a. Uh, And you mean, you know, people talk about the General Assembly, and um, 
I see this. There were some bad guys in it. I think in the Senate, uh, four of them, uh, the senators I served with served prison terms. <laughs> but there are some also some of the yeah. finest people you ever met. There. Just like any group, you're going to have good ones and bad ones. Uh, you mentioned back when you were, uh, before you joined the National Guard in Washington, uh, you wanted to, uh, you thought about going to the military academy. Yeah, I took, I put in for the competitive exam, mm -hmm. and I went down to the War Department to take my physical, and uh, I busted it because I had to, I found out I had to wear glasses. At that time, you had to have 20-20 vision. Not well, enough to keep you out of the uh, no. army, but uh, that. Uh, well, what was what was your motivation? You said you came back and said you liked the army. Uh, what was your motivation to try to go to the military academy? I don't know. There's a, there's a picture in there of a friend of mine, is Russell King. He and I, did, we were going to Central High School, and we would discuss at time. He wanted to go to the Naval Academy, I wanted to go to West Point. And, uh, I was in the ROTC there. It was, okay. it, it, and I'd read a lot of history and stuff. That, and it attracted me. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, at, at, I, I was offered, as any of them was, if, if I when I got to Meade, I could take give me 30 days leave, and I could go back to active duty, uh, receive a promotion, and stay in. But I had been saving my money, and I was now determined I was going to go to, to engineering school, and. Um, I had an aunt living, an uncle living here, and came to visit him and applied to Georgia Tech and came, was in the big World War II class at Georgia Tech. Uh -huh. You brought some uh, information that I think we should get on camera here. Uh, one is a picture of a, a second good, lieutenant. good looking guy here. <laughs> a second lieutenant. I'm going to put this up to the camera, be sure we can. Yeah. yeah, don't get too close there. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And we've also got some pictures here, appears to be from a magazine. Would you describe what those well, are? This is uh, it, it's pictures that came, and I have the old news. I have the old newspaper, the old prints at home. But I made went over and had these those printed out so it'd go in a book, and that's. Uh, the, who were going from Washington, D.C. to Fort Bliss. And was that covered by a, a magazine? Life magazine went down. Those are pictures are from Life magazine. Uh, I'd never been to Florida. And the, one of the stops we were going into was Defuniac Springs, Florida. And I was looking forward to sunshine. That was the coldest place I've ever been in my <laughs> life. <coughs> It's hard to do to get an album in there and, and get the detail. Okay. What I'd like to do is give uh, Tony and Phil an opportunity to ask any more okay. questions you might have for uh, we start. Well, you can find if you want. Incidentally, these are. Uh... Tell us about that map. This map is, is of New Guinea, and we were at Winch Haven, is here, is where we were, and then we went down to Hollandia, Hollandia and that's where we went on up to the island. And was this the best map you had? Beg your pardon? This was, was this the best map you had? Well, that's just, they didn't, we didn't need a map that time. This, uh, in Fort Bliss, one thing about it, we were in tents, but they were floored, and we had gas heat, so we we're comfortable. The only thing is the dust storms. You remember a dust storm down there that summer? Uh, the other thing is, we, we talked about equipment. We were at, at Bremerton, Washington. But then I was in a gun battery. And one day, the truck drove, came up, and gave us. Uh, a radar, SCR 268. We didn't know anything about it. They what? handed us a book and said, here it is. Nope. And, what is it? And so we had to teach ourselves how to, how to, how to use that, SC, that radar. 
So that was a right arm? Mm -hmm. Right arm clip? Yeah, CR 268. Um, the, uh, this is a regimental from for the two, that's a regimental crest for the 214. Well, you've had some amazing experiences, and you were. I've, been, I've enjoyed. I've been very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I don't know there's any, I wanted to show you, but I couldn't find it. I've got it somewhere in here. But yeah, if there's anything else you would like us to get on camera, just let me know. This is a, this is the first few days everybody we went through, and this is the canal. It shows the various various parts of the of the Kudwat Canal. And that's all we had. We didn't yeah, have any good. maps. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here and uh, how honored we are to have been able to talk to you about this you and hear your story. I said, my, uh, it's one of the passions I have of the military. And uh, I'm reading now this, the book of, of uh, I, this is the canal, too. Again, these are, these are pictures from Guadalcanal. Canal. You can see the terrain there. Picking up some reflection on this. Fried and every other thing, in, but it's a. Uh, uh, you like spam, man? Huh? I don't like spam. No. <laughs> These are things they gave us to New Zealand so we could come acquainted with the natives. And they did the same thing when we went into, into uh, Peter. This is the only thing I had when we made our landing on Luzon. Talk about your interaction with the natives uh, in either New Zealand or anywhere else you were over there. And what Did you have much contact with I them? I did. The people are just as wonderful as they can be. And of course the girls are real pretty and uh, we had a good time there. It's, uh, and I made a lot of good friends. Uh, we've been back once, I have. Uh, and got to see them both the South and New Island, Good. North Island. Good. Uh, it's a, it's a, I've, when 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 we had the Olympics here, the um, I got in with the New Zealand American group because uh, I I tell you if I ever have to live any place outside the United States, I want to go to New Zealand. Uh, and so I got in with them and. They asked for us for if we could put certain people up, and we did. And we had the uh, consul stay with us, and they had uh, they took over the um, uh, they took over the uh, the. Uh, Episcopal Church at North Avenue and Peachtree. There's a unit behind for young people and all. We were in there. And so they invited us down and we went down to have uh, meet the Olympic people and, and eat with them. And they had the, some of the Maoris over with the Maori dance. Uh, it, was, it was a really wonderful time. Well, they're still very appreciative of what the American soldier did in World War II, yeah. from what I understand. They are. Uh, and this is this is our officers. Oh, yeah. uh, now, where was this? That's in New Zealand. That was all our officers. Okay. Well, I appreciate the. I hope it. As I said, I'm doing this for my kids and grandchildren, and uh, I'm leaving some details out, but you know, most of them. 
Was there anything else you would like to say about your oh, your story or a yeah. message to the people who are going to be seeing this video? Well, I have been asked to make a talk about that time, about that period of time. <laughs> the point I want to emphasize, how ill-prepared we were. We were, had one of the smallest armies in the world. Uh, <coughs> we didn't have the equipment. As I said, we had uh, a lot of World War I equipment, but we had the smallest army in the world, and we had to go from that to what we ended up with. Uh, this year, my wife and I took the, went to France and took the uh, trip down the Seine and went to Normandy. And uh, it was something I always wanted to see. And uh, you see that beach down there, we're at low tide, and that's when the landing was made, low tide. And they had a quarter of a mile to go across open train. And then there's a hill comes up, and the Germans behind that hill. And how they did it, I don't know. But you go over that cemetery, and, uh, that gets next to me because these were young kids that were buried there. It's a beautiful place. But it's, and I've seen the one in, in, in Hawaii, too. Uh, I saw Ernie Piles right there. Mm. I had uh, two, two men buried there. Yeah. One of them was killed one night in a bombing raid, and the other one committed suicide so mm. times. It's a... Uh, it was a time in history, uh, and I hope I can do this for my kids and they can go over. Well, I know your family's going to appreciate it, and we appreciate it well, because you're kind of asked me to come in. And, well, you're you're a real patriot. You joined up before the war even started, and you were drafted. You joined voluntarily and stayed in for many years. So we're you're you're, you're a hero to us. Although I don't, I know you don't think you're a hero, but you are. People talk about today we should disarm. I think we, George Washington said it, and I can't remember his exact words, but basically, if you don't have an army, you don't have much say so. That's and very he true. said it in different words, but that's basically what he said. Yeah. And uh, I hope that we, you know, if you were saying Vietnam, you know what you went through because of the newspapers and all that stuff that they put out. Uh, and, uh, that's one of the reasons <coughs> I think Reagan was correct when he went into Grenada, uh, down to Grenada. He did not, he made, I think, two or three newspaper people once and he didn't tell the rest of them what happened. He didn't let them go down there. <coughs> but that was, that's one of our national shames, in my opinion. <laughs> it was Vietnam. Uh, I was fortunate that I didn't get called back in because I'd had so damn many points I didn't, you know, I was getting the age, they, they couldn't use me over there. I thought I was going to get New Guinea though, I mean, get Korea. Oh. Because I was, yeah. I came, I don't say I came close, but that's what I thought I was going to call back to that. Uh, I was lucky. We all are very kind, and I think this is a terrific thing, and I hope our young people uh, can can realize some of these things that uh, and if you haven't been, and I'm sure most of you have been, what they've done in New Orleans is that, that World War II Museum down there is fantastic, and they're getting ready to expand again. Uh, the, Benning, the, the Infantry Museum at Benning is, a, is just outstanding. Uh, and we're getting ready to build an Army Museum at Fort Belvoir, and the Marines already have one at uh, Quantico. So I think it's good to have the preserved history of things. Well, um, you'll be, you're a big part of that by doing this, and uh, again, we thank you, thank you for your service, particularly in my, my grandkids. Got, I got still got my helmet and my canteen and cups and. 
I guess this chair rifle again, the bayonet out too. <laughs> we had to get them out of their hands, but they they like to play with that stuff. And, uh, I am going to give the gun to uh, up there to those people because it, it does have a little bit of history since the unit is up there yeah. too. Mm -hmm. so, how many of y'all are going to throw in the same? Okay. Mm -hmm.